Today we are hosting the two men who hope to be the country's defence minister after the May 21 election, Peter Dutton and Brendan O'Connor. They face a time of great strategic uncertainty with war in Ukraine and China's increasing assertiveness posing a challenge to the security and economic order that emerged after World War II. The rules of the debate have been agreed and are fully set out on the club's website, but here are the main points. Each speaker is allocated six minutes for opening remarks. After that, we'll have questions from the working media. The question should be posed as one question for both speakers or one question to one of the speakers. Separate questions to the two speakers will be disallowed and only the first question will be dealt with. This will be firmly enforced, my colleagues, as I remind my colleagues. There will be a maximum of two minutes to reply to questions and if the question has only been put to one speaker, the other speaker would have the option to respond to the answer for a maximum of one minute. There will be time limits on answers, but I may allow an extension of time in the interest of a free-flowing exchange. And at some stage during the debate, um, Mr Dutton and Mr O'Connor will be asked, allowed to ask one question of each other. Each speaker in the reverse order of the opening statements will be given one minute for closing remarks. A time clock and warning bell will be used to alert speakers when they are 20 seconds out from the conclusion of time for opening and closing comments, answers to questions and right of reply periods. A toss of the coin beforehand decided that Mr Dutton would speak first, so I'd like to ask him and welcome him to the lectern. Andrew, uh, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, thank you to the club for hosting an important debate today. Can I acknowledge uh, all of those in the audience uh, who wear our country's uniform or have in the past, and thank you very much uh, for your service to uh, our ambassadors here today and a very warm welcome to each of you in particular. And I point out uh, to those who are watching today uh, didn't see the acknowledgement of the Ukrainian ambassador before, uh, for which there was uh, a round of applause. We don't often see at the press club, but to respect and to honour you, sir, and your people and what the Ukraine is going through at the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know, uh, for the past three years, our nation has been beset by some of the most challenging international circumstances faced by any government in our lifetime. Navigating our country through a once-in-a-century global pandemic has, of course, not been easy. But there is no one alive in our country today who has done this before. And on any metric, however you look at it, Australia has weathered the storm better than almost any nation on Earth. Decisions taken by the Morrison government literally saved tens of thousands of lives and hundreds of thousands of jobs. We've kept our country safe and we've kept our economy strong. Australia has emerged from the pandemic in a position of strength and with cause for optimism about the future. But we know that we can't take that for granted. The world around us has changed and we're facing a future that is more uncertain and a region that is less safe. What seemed unthinkable five or ten or even one year ago, to be honest, has become our reality. War has returned to Europe and we are today 70 days in to Russia's immoral and illegal invasion of the Ukraine. China's intimidatory use of grey zone warfare tactics, like hacking and like economic coercion, is threatening the sovereignty and prosperity of every Indo-Pacific nation. We live in times echoing the 1930s, with belligerent autocrats seeking to once again use force to achieve political outcomes. If history has taught us anything, it is that when dictators are on the march, you can only preserve peace by preparing for war. You can only deter aggression from a position of strength. And the Morrison government is committed to building that stronger, safer Australia. Ukraine has demonstrated very clearly, if anyone needed reminding, that direct military action can only be repelled by a direct military response. We know this and so do potential aggressors. The Morrison government is committed to building a larger, stronger and better equipped Australian Defence Force. We are increasing the size and the capability of the ADF by around 30 per cent, taking the total permanent force to almost 80,000 personnel. We're investing more than $270 billion into defence capability this decade, and we're undertaking the most significant renewal of the Royal Australian Navy since the Second World War. We're revolutionising Australian 
offensive cyber capabilities, investing $10 billion into doubling the size of the ASD, the Australian Signals Directorate, and turbocharging our ability to strike back against cyber conflict. The government understands that Australia must have an effective, deployable and integrated military force if we are to deter aggression. The nuclear-powered submarines that Australia is building at Osborne through the AUKUS agreement add an entirely new dimension to such calculations. The range, the stealth, the survivability of nuclear-powered submarines make them an incredibly pow powerful deterrent and capability for our country, underpinning the security of our nation for the next 50 years. But it goes beyond that. We've purchased or built and brought into service significant and serious capability, which has made the ADF a stronger and more lethal deterrent. This has included joint air-to-surface standoff missiles to enable our FA-18 Super Hornets and our F-35 Joint Strike Fighters to hit targets at a range of 900 kilometres. We're also acquiring long-range long strike capabilities, including Tomahawk cruise missiles to be fielded on our Hobart-class air warfare destroyers, the most potent warships ever operated by our Navy. We've acquired 24 MH60R Seahawk maritime combat anti-submarine and anti-surface warfare helicopters, and we've built three of the six planned all-Australian Loyal Wingman uncrewed combat aerial vehicles. Now, in contrast, the Labor opposition likes to speak a big game on defence. But just like on borders, Australians need to look very closely at what Labor says before you see what they actually do in government. When the Coalition came to office in 2013, Labor had cut defence spending to the lowest levels since 1938 at 1.56% of GDP. In their 2012-13 budget, Labor cut defence by over 10% in real terms. It was the largest year-on-year -year fall in funding since the end of the Korean conflict. They delayed, cut or cancelled over 160 projects, not because the projects were behind time, but because they reallocated that money to other higher priorities. Now, we've undone Labor's damage and we've lift lifted defence spending to 2% of GDP. There would today have been $55 billion less in defence had Labor still been in government. This election is about deciding the choice and whether you risk Labor with our national security. Thank you, Mr Dutton. Right on six minutes, so <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, Mr O'Connor, I'd like you uh, to invite you to make your opening remarks. Yeah, well, thank you, Andrew. I'd like to firstly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Can I thank the National Press Club for the invitation to debate today, acknowledge the parliamentary colleagues that are here in particular uh, Tim Watts, uh, and can I also uh, thank the press gallery? Uh, it's an important debate to be had, and of course you might understand I do disagree with what some of the things Peter has said. I acknowledge him too as my counterpart today. Eighty years ago yesterday, the Royal Australian Navy and Air Force joined US forces uh, to, res to fight back on an aggressor that sought to take hold in Port Moresby and the Solomon Islands. The Battle of the Coral Sea was a tactical draw but a strategic victory. And in fact, it, what followed were two decisive wins in the battles of Midway and Guadalcanal. Seven months before that, a newly elected Prime Minister, John Curtin, turned our eyes to the United States and that strategic pivot provided an opportunity to defend this nation effectively. Eighty years on, that important security alliance is still in place and it's been deepened and broadened uh, and in large part that's because of the bipartisanship it enjoys. So people shouldn't be surprised that Labor supported the AUKUS proposition when it was put to us. We should, you shouldn't be surprised that we also supported President Biden enlivening the Quad uh, or for, for that matter agreeing very swiftly on the government's decision to provide uh, the, uh, to provide lethal and non-lethal aid uh, to Ukraine. And can I just again acknowledge the ambassador to the Ukraine that's here today, a remarkable uh, representation and very important that he's here. Can I also say that um, we also believe that we need to, as an opposition, support the government of the day on that national security issues. And that's even when the government plays partisan politics on national security. Uh, but we also have another job, and that's to hold the government to account. 
Uh, and the fact is, uh, this government has failed to deliver the defence capabilities that this country needs. In almost a decade, they have not delivered the assets that they've promised. Uh, and uh, I think it's also fair to say that, and in fact Greg Sheridan recently wrote, that if you could guarantee Australia's security by announcements that have been made, we'd be the most secure nation in the world. Uh, furthermore, I think it's also fair to say that the Morrison government's made some serious national security mistakes, some significant foreign policy missteps. They've had six defence ministers in nine years. They've had four defence ministers in four years under Scott Morrison, which has resulted in, in inadequate oversight and focus on this portfolio. They've not only failed to deliver a submarine in almost a decade, they've spent $5,500 million not doing so. They have had helicopters that can't provide cover fire for our troops and have cancelled that contract, it's wasting billions of dollars. A frigate contract that is uh, delayed, riddled with serious engineering issues, are billions of dollars over budget. Existing vessels with too little firepower, not updating the naval ship, ship uh, building plan as promised. Our only armed drone program, Sky Guardian, cancelled inexplicably, nothing to replace it. They've announced the life of type extension to the Collins class submarines six years later than advised. On the national security front, Scott Morrison allowed for the Darwin port to be leased to a state-owned Chinese enterprise uh, for 99 years. Uh, just remember that. Labor, it was Labor when in government, stationed the US Marines in Darwin, and it was Scott Morrison that flogged off the port to the Chinese. The fact is there are more mistakes too. We've seen it with the um, allowing a Chinese-owned company to store sensitive government data from the Australian Tax Office, Treasury, and if you can believe it, the Department of Defence. On the foreign policy front, they've da badly damaged our relationship uh, with the French, uh, with the, re re you know, the currently now newly re-elected French president. Uh, the European state, which has the greatest, greatest presence in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, compounding that mistake, they forced President Biden to apologise to the French for that fallout. They've abandoned the strategic ambiguity approach adopted by the US when it comes to the conflict uh, with uh, potential conflict with, uh, that might involve Taiwan. They've turned on its head the Teddy Roosevelt maxim, talk softly and carry a big stick. In fact, they shout from the rooftops, but they don't deliver the stick needed and it won't be here until it appears 2040. And finally, they drop the ball in the Pacific. Not being seen to treat Pacific Island countries fairly, or seriously cutting foreign aid, mocking their concerns about climate change by failing to comprehend the importance of soft power diplomacy. They have failed the art of statecraft. And that's why we do need a government that thinks strategically and long term. We need a government that won't offend our friends. We need a government that enhances local content. We need a government that engages more in our region. Frankly, friends, we can do better. We need to elect an Albanese Labor government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr O'Connor. Um, we've seen the early parts of the election campaign dominated by the security agreement between the Solomon Islands and China. A straightforward question for you both. Is Australia less safe today because of this agreement? I'm happy, I'm happy to go first. Uh, I think Australia is uh, alongside with the United States and the United Kingdom, with India, with Japan, with many other countries in our region uh, in lockstep uh, in the effort to maintain peace in our region. But I don't think we should pretend to the Australian people that we don't live in an uncertain time. I acknowledge the incredible work of uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Sed Sazelja, who's uh, here today, and uh, the way in which he is engaged uh, in the Pacific. But it is a tough, a tough market. And as we're seeing uh, right across the region, in fact, right across the world, China's uh, influence into Africa, their influence into broader Asia, their influence into even uh, Europe is quite phenomenal. And the Labor Party talking down our country at this time is not in our national best interests. Uh, so how are we a safer country? How are we a stronger country? Well, we're a safer country by investing in the defence forces. And that is exactly what this government has done. We arrested the money that was taken out of defence when Labor was in government and we've reinstated money into defence and we have 
acquired capability which will underpin our security and provide a greater capacity to contribute to the effort of the Allies uh, over the next decades. And that is a very significant choice for people to make at this election, whether they risk those gains to go back to the uncertainty that Labor provides on national security. Brennan's very fond of bringing up uh, John Curtin and talking about 80 years ago. And I agree with him. I mean, that was the last Labor Prime Minister who had any interest in matters of national security or defence. Thank you. Oh, Mr O'Connor, two minutes. Well, I don't agree with that, of course. I mean, Bob Hawke uh, actually spent more money on defence per annum than the Howard government. Bob Hawke commissioned the Collins-class submarines, the only submarines we've ever had in this country. With respect to the Solomon Islands, we have failed there. We have failed to prevent a security pact between the Solomon Islands and China. And I'm not suggesting it was easy to stop, but more should have been done. The Foreign Minister should have been there. I mean, in fact, I mean, Peter, Scott Morrison should have got on the phone to the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands and actually, uh, you know, pleaded with him not to go down this path. We know that other Pacific Island countries are not happy with this arrangement. Uh, we needed to, move, to do more earlier. If you look at the national security intelligence, we were aware of the move in the Solomon Islands in this direction for years. We know they changed their affiliation from Taiwan to Beijing three years ago. So we had plenty of warning to be putting in an effort. But frankly, I agree with, uh, the, with Peter that we have to invest more in defence. And things have changed now compared to 10 years ago. Of course we need to invest more. And that's why we support the investment that's being made. But you need also to deploy diplomacy. You need to invest in the region. They must be your you know, friends, not just your neighbours. You have to treat them equally. And frankly, they don't feel we've done that because we've mocked them on things that concern them. We've derided them about their concerns about climate change. We have, we've recently announced a policy that will invest more, helping them with aerial surveillance, helping them train uh, their military, um, investing in broadcasting. Australia has to have a voice in the region. Now, Scott Morrison thinks it's funny that we would want to actually broadcast in the region. He doesn't get soft power diplomacy. He doesn't understand statecraft. He doesn't understand the region. And that's why we're in this predicament. Mr Dutton, would you like to rebut any of that? I, I, I certainly do. Uh, a, a, a couple of points. I mean, I, I want to dispel this myth that Labor's been peddling uh, over the last few weeks that somehow the problem in the Indo-Pacific is, is of Australia's making. It is not. Uh, it is not. Now, if you look at uh, Prime Minister Sogabare's own words, uh, not just what he's had to say in the last uh, 24 hours or so, but what he's had to say in the run-up to this agreement with China. He has not a word of criticism for our country. He's not saying that the relationship is broken. He's not saying that Australia is an unreliable partner. He's not saying that Scott Morrison hasn't engaged with him as a leader-to-leader -leader in, in a leader-to-leader -leader dialogue. He's not saying that we aren't providing support through capacity building. There's none of that coming out of the words of the Solomon Islands government. It is all coming out for political reasons from Labor. The reason that we're in the position at the moment is because under President Xi, China is on a very different path. They're amassing nuclear weapons. You're seeing in the South China Sea the militarisation of 20 points uh, of reclaimed territory. And if the Labor Party can't see that, they only see a need to bag us through the course of a campaign, then I think it demonstrates they're unfit for government at, uh, at the election. Just a minute. Are you politicising Look, we, we see we're stating the obvious, that the relationship uh, with Pacific Island countries, in particular Solomon Islands, has, uh, been, has deteriorated in recent times. You can imagine what Scott Morrison may have said as opposition leader if this had happened under Labor's watch. The fact is it's happened under Scott Morrison's watch and he has to take some responsibility. But as always, whether it was failing to get vaccinations or delivering rat tests, even in this area of national security, Scott Morrison refuses to accept responsibility for a failure, a failure to properly engage and prevent a compact between China. I mean, we're talking about an island that's 2,000 kilometre flight from our eastern uh, coastline. It is of concern to us, and it will be, it will, there'll be a lot of effort now having to mitigate the chances of a naval base being established by the Chinese in the years to come. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to my, uh, my colleagues from the, the, the working media and I'll just remind, please, one question only. <laughs> uh, ben Packham. 
Uh, good day, gentlemen. Um, thank you for appearing in this debate. Um, like uh, many a marginal seat family, um, the Defence Department and the ADF are on a fixed income. So that means, obviously, that the $270 billion in um, new capabilities uh, that are being promised under the Integrated Investment Program, that money uh, erodes over time with inflation. And inflation, as we know, is running rampant, particularly in the United States, where we buy uh, most of our major capabilities, um, missiles, etc., that we need to defend this country. So, um, uh, ASPE estimates say defence lost an extra, an additional 700 million in 2021-22 on revised inflation numbers, and that's looking like being 1.4 billion in 2022-23. So, to both of you, I'd like to ask. Um, and this is before you even get to the question of do we need to lift de defence spending to uh, meet the China threat, will you um, consider uh, in the short to medium term um, boosting the defence budget to counteract the corrosive effects of inflation on the defence budget? I'm happy to... Well, look, I think, of course, we know that inflation is running very high. Um, under this government, uh, despite its promise of uh, providing e economic dividends to the, to the Australian people, we've seen inflation run away at a very high uh, rate. And for that reason, when you're making expenditure decisions, you have to make assessments about what it means for costs. And I think to that extent, if elected, the Labor government will have to examine that, have to examine the impact of inflation on any area of public policy, but of course, in particular, given the circumstances we're in, uh, we have to look at it in terms of national security and defence. I just want to take up the comment that was made by Peter in relation to uh, our record on defence expenditure. Firstly, things were very different back then. But if you look at the expenditure of the Rudd-Gillard years, you compare them with the Howard years, uh, the government's, on average, annually, was between 1.7 and 1.8 of GDP, on average, per annum. That's the reality. And Peter and others can keep talking about one year, but on average. Remember, these contracts go for 5, 10, 20, 30 years, and it's really about the ongoing expenditure, not picking out one year to suit your political argument. So I make the point that's the case. Secondly, Labor does support a minimum of 2%. We support the expenditure that Peter has outlined in terms of the defence acquisitions. We support the defence budget overall. But I take your point. Any government, whoever, if, if whether the, the, the government's re-elected or we're elected, will have to examine the impact on what it means for defence assets and acquiring those assets. Mr Dunn. Uh, ben, it's, uh, I, I don't want anybody to be left with the impression today that the Labor Party will increase funding if they're elected on the 21st of May. I mean, Brendan's words then effectively parroted the words said before uh, the election of the right government. Labor will always give you a guarantee that they're going to spend money or more money in government on defence, and they always, without exception, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of how precarious the times might be, the projections that are available to you, they always find a higher priority and always take money away from the defence force, which means the men and women of the Australian Defence Force, as you point out, and it also means away from our ability to acquire the capability that those men and women need. Now, over the forward estimates, defence spending increases on average by 5.7 per cent year on year. We will spend in 22-23 about $48 billion in defence and we will continue to grow that each year. And to the other point that you made uh, in your question, do we need to spend more on, on defence? Yes, we do. Because on every prediction, the circumstances will deteriorate in our region and potentially in Europe. And I don't think anybody at the moment could predict the situation in the Indo-Pacific or indeed in Europe uh, in 12 months' time, in 12 years' time. And so the capability that we need to acquire for today is incredibly important and we're doing that and we need to make sure that uh, we're providing for the uncertainty of tomorrow. But you don't do that uh, the way in which Labor did it. Uh, I would love today to be commissioning a submarine that Labor had ordered or even, you know, a single boat, not one. Not one during their time in government. And I have to live with that. And the Australian public has to live with that reality. And would it be repeated if they came into government again? Of course it would, because the hollow promises you're hearing now are exactly what you heard in the run-up to the 2007 election. Well, I'd like to rebut some of those points. Firstly, can I just say, uh, 
Labor did commission uh, Armidale's Bay class vessels. Uh, we also got back on track the, the, uh, the destroyers that are really fallen off the rails under the Howard years. We also had to commission a review into the uh, Collins class submarines because only one was in, left in the water after the Howard years. And it was through that review that we got up to five of the six in the water at any one time. A massive renovation, increasing the optimal capa capability of those submarines was critical. So we did many things. But I think it's also important to note things have dramatically changed and it's almost like Peter doesn't want to recognise that. I mean, a year after we lost office, uh, you know, Tony Abbott was inviting President Xi Jinping to address the parliament. That's how much things have changed since then. And of course, you do reflect your investment uh, in defence and national security based on advice we've provided. Now, the strategic update of 2020 provided to the government talks about the need to invest more. But one of the problems I have is the little investments that's been made on the short-term capability gaps that needs to be addressed. OK, thank you. For our next question, I'd like to turn to uh, Andrew Green. Gentlemen, Andrew Green from the ABC. Picking up where Brendan uh, left on capability and specifically submarines, by the current projections, we'll be getting the first nuclear-powered submarines for Australia in the late 2030s. Do either of you believe that can be significantly sped up? And what else can we do to meet the submarine capability gap? Specifically, why aren't we looking at an interim capability, a so-called son of Collins? Mr Dutton. Uh, Andrew, a couple of points. Uh, firstly, the United States hadn't shared the intellectual uh, property, the secret behind the, uh, the reactor uh, with any other country and uh, hadn't done so uh, um, since 1958 uh, when they shared it with the Brits. So uh, the historic nature of AUKUS and not just the submarine element, but what we're doing in space, what we're doing in AI, quantum uh, and in many other areas of, uh, of endeavour is quite remarkable. And I think our country should be very proud of that. In relation to the submarines, uh, I do believe, uh, having been central to the negotiations, to the agreement uh, and the subsequent discussions, that we can acquire capability much sooner than what some of the pundits are projecting at the moment. And we'll have more to say about that uh, if we're elected uh, later in the year. And I think it's quite remarkable that the United States and the United Kingdom have allowed us uh, to conduct the negotiations in the way that they have. We've had people from the US and the UK visiting Osborne here in Canberra, uh, meeting with our experts. And similarly, we've had an exchange uh, to London and to Washington. Uh, they want us to acquire that capability because they know that it is required in our part of the world. Uh, in terms of the capability that we have now, I don't want anybody to underestimate the ability of the Collins class. The Collins class in its modern form has a stealth-like capability which makes it the equal of the US and the UK boats. It works alongside them and it does so in an incredibly efficient fashion, and that's recognised by both the Brits and the Americans. We don't want a third class of, of uh, submarines, and I know that some commentators uh, continue to write this. The clearest advice I had in relation to our discussions about whether we should go with the nuclear submarines came from the Chief of the Defence Force, the Chief of Navy and the Vice Chief of the Defence Force, not to go with a third platform. And there are many reasons, and we haven't got time to go into them now, as to why you wouldn't do that. And cost is one, but very far down the list. So it is not in our national interest to, uh, to pretend that we can have a third class of submarine. Somehow we can buy it off the shelf. I want someone to explain to me where this shelf is, uh, because I don't know. I don't know where the submarine shelf is, the used car yard down the road uh, here, where you know there's an 86 model uh, submarine that's for sale uh, that nobody else has acquired. I'd be down there in a heartbeat. Uh, but yeah. it's not the reality. OK. So let, let's, let's stick to the facts. Thank you. Do I get four minutes as well, or what? <laughs> Mr O'Connor, do you know please, where the shelf please. is? <laughs> now, uh, look, we, we want to see the submarines delivered under AUKUS. Uh, Anthony Albanese wrote to, the, wrote to Scott Morrison and indicated we'd like to be part of a, uh, a committee, a bipartisan committee, to oversight the 18-month review. Now, the, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, chose not to do that, but we, are, we do have a bipartisan uh, approach to making sure we get the best assets possible. 
Uh, and it's not just submarines either, I might add. It's obviously other technologies. And Peter's right, we get access to technologies of the United States and Britain which we may not, we've not had before. And that gives us an opportunity uh, to access, in accessing those technologies, to actually invest uh, in research and innovate, invent, and commercialise our own defence assets through that collaboration. So that's the, the first thing I'd say. In relation to the potential gap or the um, perceived gap that might exist between now and then, firstly, I would agree with Peter that the Collins class submarines are very, very capable boats. Uh, and to that extent, we should be happy that we've got them in the water and they're working efficiently and we've got the crew. Um, however, if we can bring forward, and Peter sounds confident, but if we could bring forward the delivery of nuclear-propelled submarines, well, that would be a very good thing. Uh, now, in doing that, we need to do a lot, of, a lot of things. It's not just the boat itself. We have to invest in the skills to actually crew those submarines. And I know already uh, the ADF are working with um, our counterparts in the UK and US Navy to, to be acquainted with those skills. But we will need to invest a lot more because it takes a lot of effort to find the people, the submariners who are willing to be on those boats, let alone be on the larger boats that stay under longer. But we do need to do it as quickly as we can. And if we can expedite that process, if we can uh, work out a way to deliver those assets, then we should do that. Just in relation to any other ca capability gap, it may not be needed, as, and I agree with Peter, that, uh, another submarine, but we do need to see whether there's other capability gaps. It might be looking at the Hobart a destroyer. Uh, whether we need to uh, have more of those. There might be other things. So, look, it's very difficult from opposition uh, to, to make decisions on some of those most significant complex contracts. But if elected, we'll, the first thing we would be doing is getting a complete assessment from the National Security Committee of Cabinet, from the ADF, the Defence Department and others about what is needed to be done. Short-term capability gaps, medium, long-term gaps. That, that will be a priority. Uh, of an Albanese Labor government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr O'Connor. Our next question is from Anthony Galloway. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your addresses. Uh, just to follow on from Andrew's question, uh, if either of you receive advice as Defence Minister that you could get the first nuclear submarine in the water five years sooner if you build it in America or Britain, and I'm talking majority build assembled in one of those countries, would you do that? Would you build one or two of the first nuclear submarines to get that capability sooner? Mr O'Connor? Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go first. No, no, so am I. Sorry. I really, I think it's because it's been asked... <laughs> we're asked all the time about this. <laughs> uh, a, a couple of things. I mean, there, there's... Uh, Anthony, constraints, obviously, within... Uh, and again, you know, coming back to my point before about just dealing with the reality here, there are constraints within the supply chains in both the US and the UK. Uh, that's, that's the reality. Again, if you look at nuclear submarine or submarine, even diesel electric uh, uh, manufacturing construction uh, around the world, I mean, everybody is at capacity uh, because they're watching the way in which the Chinese are ramping up their own assets at the moment. So I, I think... Uh, uh, from our perspective, um, we've been clear about our commitment to Osborne, to uh, domestic capability, and the Americans have also spoken very strongly about uh, nuclear stewardship, which is important to them because they don't want an accident, and of course uh, nobody, um, including ourselves, uh, wants any accident. Uh, we want to acquire the skills, we want to train the people up, as Brennan pointed out before, the government's uh, got scholarships and we've, we're enrolling people in nuclear programs, etc. Uh, to be able to to crew uh, a, a, a submarine, so it's it's difficult to see that uh, to see that prospect. Um, but our commitment is uh, to see them built here in South Australia, and then uh, I hope that we can make an announcement uh, as to which submarine we're going with uh, in a condensed period shorter than the, the 18 months that we've spoken about, and we're on track to be able to do that. Uh, and then I think uh, we'll, uh, we'll look at ways in which we can condense that timeline. I mean, I effectively agree that ideally you build uh, defence assets here. Um, obviously, there'll be parts of a, such an asset that would not be built here, uh, nuclear-propelled components of that submarine. But you'd want to be building capacity over time. Uh, I also agree there's un it's very unlikely there's going to be a submarine just to be provided to us, and even if there were, we don't have the crew that are currently trained 
to, to properly, uh, to properly uh, operate that uh, asset. Uh, so my view on defence assets across the board is that ideally you manufacture them here because that's a defence asset in itself, sovereign capability. Secondly, you, if you can't build it all here, you build as much as you can build here, and if it's a long-term contract, you'd, you'd actually look to increase the proportion of local content over the course of that contract. So in other words, you'd build in uh, an increased capacity for the, defen the local defence industry to, to deliver, because sovereign capability is an asset in and of itself. And we know there are going to be supply chain problems. If you, if you think about what's being delivered to Ukraine at the moment, which has been you know, remarkable and more needs to be done, we know that. But that, that leads to shortages elsewhere. So what it really show, says to me is we need to find ways to increase our stockpile, increase our capacity to build assets without relying on others if we can. And that takes a lot of investment. And I think uh, we need to be thinking in, on the, in those ways, on those terms, when we talk about assets. I did. As a defence minister, though, you, you want to make sure you've got what you've got to defend the nation. But along the way, you have to build up the capability to do it here. Uh, not just for jobs, not just for the economy, but for defending the country. Thank you. The next question is from uh, Andrew Connell. Hi, oh, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Question for Mr Dutton and Mr O'Connor can respond. You and Scott Morrison say Labor are about appeasing China. What do you mean by this? How would they appease China? And you said in Parliament the CCP wants Labor to win. Why do you think that? Well, Andrew, I'm looking forward to Brendan's response uh, to, <laughs> to my, my answer. Um, oh, you'll get a response. I think it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, give him two minutes. Uh, I think, Andrew, uh, we are dealing with the reality of the new China. And I think Australians should be wide-eyed, you know, about this, I think people should be under no illusion. There's no need to embellish the intelligence that we're reading. There's no need to pretend that something uh, is, uh, is happening. Uh, the fact is that every like-minded country has drawn a similar conclusion about the direction of China. Now, there's no doubt uh, in my mind uh, that the Chinese Communist Party would like to see a change of government uh, in, at the 21 May election. No question at all. And I think there's uh, evidence of that uh, on the WeChat activity, which is a, a Communist Party uh, dominated and influenced platform, the interference with the Prime Minister's own WeChat page there, uh, the way in which uh, uh, editors of uh, Chinese language newspapers in our country have been lent on, I think is further evidence and uh, um, other elements obviously that, uh, that I can't go into publicly. Uh, so I stand by that statement, believe it very strongly. In relation to uh, the appeasement element, uh, uh, I think if you look at all of the language of Penny Wong, uh, Penny Wong believes that uh, she can go to Beijing on a charm offensive and that she could change the direction of China under President Xi. President Xi, of course, would be laughing under his breath as he was entertaining his dear friend here in Beijing and that only if she was able to wind back some of the acts of aggression of the Morrison government from signing AUKUS to acquiring missile capability, that the conversation could continue, and they continue to buy time. And I've been open and frank in my commentary because I want to see our country stay safe. I want to see our region continue the prosperity. I want to see people in countries that uh, surround us, that aren't as wealthy as we are, lifted from poverty, and we can only do that if we've got security and peace in our region. And uh, that's at the heart of everything we're trying to do Thanks. to defend our nation. Thank you, Mr Dutton. Mr O'Connor, your response? Well, I don't agree with that conspiracy theory of Peter Dutton, that we somehow there's some benefit for China, given the position that Labor's taken in relation uh, to China and its changed conduct. As I said from I the outset... As I've said from the outset, if I'm just allowed to finish, Peter, you've just had to go. If, as I said from the outset, um, we know China has changed. We know it's now more assertive, more aggressive, more coercive. And, in fact, Penny Wong, who's just been verbaled uh, by Peter, 
made that clear in contributions uh, last year where he outlined the significant shift that's happened in the region. And as Dennis Richardson said, an eminent, well, probably the most eminent, former head of security agencies, many agencies, as we all know, said it is not in this country's interest for a political party to attack the other major political party on the basis of appeasing China, particularly when it's untrue. Where, where would China relations with China be different under Labor compared to the government, though? What, what's the, what, what, what well, I think we've uh, and this. I think we've been saying now for some time. We've agreed with the government. We have, and when I've been asked questions about, am I blaming the government for the changed behaviour of China? I've made unequivocal made it unequivocally clear that it is not the Australian government or Australia that's changed its behaviour. It is China. It is that has become aggressive, assertive, and coercive, and it's acted, it's using and applying uh, methods of operation that we would not conduct, we would not operate uh, under those same uh, for, forms of behaviour. That's I've made that very clear. Anthony Albanese's made that very clear. Penny Wong's made that clear. Uh, I think the reality is, yes, you will see China uh, involve itself in uh, our matters from time to time improperly. But that doesn't mean it wants one over the other, and of course it suits Peter's purposes to suggest otherwise. Do you think China will change, given that the world is moving towards a, a, a tougher sort of stance? My, my assessment is no, uh, Andrew. I think if you look at the relationship now between China and Russia at a time when the rest of the world is applying sanctions in a unified way or condemning Russia for the acts of aggression, China is... Uh, forming this unbreakable bond. When you look at the amassing of nuclear weapons, militarisation in the South China Sea, the loss of Indian troops on the shared land border at the hands of Chinese troops only within the last few years, uh, I think it's deeply concerning and it's heading in one direction. And that's why we do need to be strong, not weak, uh, as Labor was when they were last in government. And we need to make sure uh, that we stand with our allies, and that's been the basis of the AUKUS agreement, so that uh, we can project that strength. I want nothing more than a normalised relationship with China. We have an incredible diaspora community here, wonderful Australians who have worked hard, they've educated their children, they're law-abiding, a huge part of the success story of migration to our country. But the direction of the Chinese government at the moment, uh, including in our own region, is alarming and we should be realistic about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Now it's time, I guess, open mic night, where both of you can ask a question of each other. Uh, who would like to go first? I'm happy to ask uh, Peter a question. Um, I've got several in, in mind, but I'll just start, use one. Just ask one. Um, <laughs> no profanities, though, Brent. <laughs> not with the not with the mics, <laughs> anyway. But uh, um, look, given the um, upon reflection, uh, when you think uh, to the comments you made about it about it being uh, inconceivable that we would not engage in a war with a nuclear superpower given uh, an invasion of Taiwan that might involve the United States. Do you think on reflection, answering that hypothetical in the affirmative was the right thing to do? And would you say it again? Well, Brendan, we have an alliance with the United States. Uh, it's served us well for decades. The United States has been the underpinning of security in our own region for the last 80 years. I know at different times during Labor's history, including under the leadership of Mark Latham, I think you voted for Mark, uh, there was talk about breaking the alliance with the United States. That will never happen under a coalition government. We are a population of 25.8 million people. We have, in many ways, punched above our weight. We are a great and reliable friend and ally, not just in our region, but uh, with the big and mighty uh, within the Five Eyes context and beyond that, in the Quad and elsewhere. And so do I think that uh, we would shirk away from our responsibility to be a good ally with the United States? No, I don't. And I don't think that would be in the interests of our country. I think you would put us in an incredibly precarious position if Labor again decided to break the alliance with the United States. Well, I think happened. that would be a travesty. And I don't think... Uh, uh, that's never happened. I, I don't... Th well, it was spoken about, and the hard left of the Labor Party would break the alliance uh, with, with the United States tomorrow, Brendan. Sir. You can go through your colleagues one by one who would seek to do that. And this is a time where we need to stand up together. Brendan today hasn't been able to point out one quote, not one quote from Prime Minister Sogavare of criticism of our country. 
Not a single well, word. Well, that's not true. Not a he single word has he been able to point Maybe out. You should ask me that. And so I think uh, when you look at who has changed uh, in the region, it is China. And as I've said before, uh, I want to make sure that, uh, that we can have a normalised relationship. But we're not going to cede our democracy or we're not going to be in a position where uh, we don't question human rights abuses. Uh, we are a country that stand up for our values and we're not going to deviate from that. And that's the strength uh, of the coalition. And that is the choice that people have to make at this election between a weak government led by Anthony Albanese, who will take money away from defence, uh, or a proven track record of the Morrison government of supporting the men and women of the ADF and investing in a record way to keep our country safe. Thank you. Uh, Mr Dutton, your question to Mr O'Connor. Brendan, the last time you sat around the National Security Committee table, you were responsible for the arrival of some 12,000 people on 184 boats. What do you say to the men and women of the Australian Navy who are still suffering from PTSD today from having pulled those bodies from the water of those women and children who drowned at sea? Well, I firstly obviously have enormous admiration for the Customs and Naval personnel who rescued people at sea, who would go into dangerous situations in high sea states. And I can remember it vividly in 2010 when the, I, would, and I flew into Christmas Island on the day that the that, uh, that uh, unseaworthy vessel um, founded on the rocks uh, of uh, Christmas Island. Uh, our crew went, in, went into tenders and ribs, plucked, retrieved and rescued people out of the water. I was involved with the administrator having to set up a temporary morgue uh, of people. People had arrived or tried to arrive. Um, it was a devastating time for those people, for the naval and customs personnel who I later on commend, uh, met privately because of their brave actions. They didn't have to go in that day. Uh, and I assure you, I was aware of it before then, but even but after then, I was very much instrumental in moving and changing the policy of the ALP to take on a more deterrent position in relation to people that leave countries of transition, as it was the case with that vessel. Because I do believe you need to have deterrence. Uh, and frankly, we did try to put some things in place, and we'll never know if they were to work. But I'll tell you this, uh, I didn't join up with the Greens like Scott Morrison, Tony Abbott and Peter Dutton to stop us trying to put in place a Malaysian arrangement. They voted with the Greens not because they thought the Malaysian arrangement wouldn't work. They, they voted with the Greens because they were scared it would. So they acted in a partisan way back then on this issue. Now, frankly, uh, we did put in offshore processing, but we do believe processing should happen, but we put it in place. This government, and I'll give it credit, obviously, put in other elements that have provided a deterrence, uh, and Labor supports Operation Sovereign Borders on that basis. Uh, but we were looking you to try. Uh, we were trying to. We were looking to try other options as well. And advice. frankly, and frankly, Peter Dutton and others lined up with the Greens and stopped that in the parliament. Okay. That's okay. the truth of it. It's... That's what happened because they played base okay. domestic politics instead of putting the national interest first. Okay. And that's what we were left with. Now I'll, I'll pay tribute to the ability we to stop to... those vessels. But can I just say, in relation to offshore processing, we need to also process people. It's a verb. Uh, you know, pursuant to our obligations under the okay. Convention. You don't leave okay. people indefinitely in a hellish hole, All right. which has happened here. Thank you. Thank you. We've got to uh, move on. We're uh, keep pushing up against time. Our next question is from Kim Bergman. Uh, this question mainly for Minister Dutton, but uh, I'll be interested in your views, and it's about diminishing transparency surrounding defence decision-making. Why is it that the people of Australia have to learn about things like the cancelled armed UCAV contract, and the cancelled Australian build of the large Pacific support vessel through bureaucrats being grilled during Senate estimates rather than from the minister responsible? Well, Kim, I've been very clear uh, to the Defence Force, uh, to the Secretary of my department, uh, to the Chief of the Defence Force and the Service Chiefs, I've been very clear to the Australian people that uh, where we have programs that are not performing, uh, those programs will be terminated. And I've been clear with our industry partners that uh, we value the partnership very much, but we expect in a contracted arrangement for there to be performance. 
uh, and where people aren't performing, uh, then we aren't going to continue that arrangement. Now, in the vast majority of cases, we do have uh, a successful outcome and the Defence Department, along with uh, our industry partners, are able to deliver capability on time, uh, on budget and enhance the capacity to defend our country. Uh, so I don't want the problem projects to overshadow the successes that we have and evidenced by what we've been able to acquire just over the last couple of years. Uh, we have the ability uh, to make announcements, uh, whether it's by you know, a release from me uh, or advice to the department first in a situation where uh, there's been a decision that's been leaked and the media's picked it up or the opposition's received that through a disaffected party and that's uh, put to an official within Senate estimates before we're able to make uh, or we're prepared to make uh, a public announcement. Well, I, I, can't, I can't change that. I mean, that's the, the nature of your business is to try and form relationships with people that will, you know, pass you a document or <laughs> give you a heads up on something. So I don't want to do the journalists out of business, but that's the reality <laughs> of it. So, uh, but all, all I'd say is that we are spending $270 billion this decade and we need to spend more. And if you look at some of the projects, Loyal Wingman is a project where that has the potential to be a billion dollar a year export. It's going to be a huge success story, I believe, for our country, for Boeing, the partnership that we have there. It's a necessary capability. It's going to support us and our allies. And it's a huge achievement. And I think we should be very proud of it. Thank you, Mr. Dutton. Mr. O'Connor. I mean, clearly there should be more transparency. You don't get to boast about you know, Red Spice and while you cancel secretly the Sky Guardian, only uncovered during estimates. You shouldn't be able, you shouldn't be able to boast about building a support vessel, uh, then meanwhile buy a second-hand one and hide it in the Canary Islands. I mean, the fact is the government has to be more accountable and transparent on these matters. It shouldn't say one thing and do another. It should disclose things it chooses to change its mind on. Uh, unfortunately, there's a litany of examples where the government has not done what it said it will do uh, and often uh, has promoted things that are new but never mentioned the things that it's cancelled. I mean, we remember, we started, this government started with a defence minister who's famous for saying, uh, we can't build a canoe. So you wonder whether they actually really genuinely support sovereign capability. Thank you. Our next question, Doug Dingwall from Canberra Times. Good afternoon, Defence Minister and Mr O'Connor. Uh, it's a question for both of you. The Defence Department last year was warned by ASPE its spending on contractors is a, quote, looming iceberg that could eat into its acquisition budget. Uh, both its numbers of contractors and the external workforce have grown by thousands over the last two to three years. How will you respond to those warnings that this spending could sap the acquisition budget if you win the election? Sure. Look, um, we've already got a broader policy to examine the use of um, consultants and contractors to see whether they're efficient. We know there's been a terrible depletion in the Department of Veteran Affairs uh, of removing, uh, you know, dedicated public servants and putting in place untrained, often unskilled, not always sensitive um, like labour hire employees to try and do a job they're not particularly made for. Uh, we've got concerns across the, uh, to be honest, across government about the overuse of some of these uh, consultancies. Uh, and as I think Jim Chalmers has made clear and Katie Gallagher that we'd be examining the value for money. We've already made a commitment in, the, in so far as the Department of Veterans Affairs is concerned is to de rededicate, I think it's $250 million to, to, to renovate that department because it's in a terrible way. It's got 60,000 uh, veterans waiting for their matters, their applications to be properly sorted. We need to do better and that's a very good example of what's happened under the, this government's watch, I believe. Thank you. Uh, well, Doug, a, a couple of points. I mean, firstly, uh, it's obvious when you take money from defence uh, over the forward estimates or into the out years that it's very hard to plan because you've got a recurrent cost with wages and uh, under Labor spending $10 billion a year less, it does mean that you need to trim numbers. And that's the impact. It provides great uncertainty for the workforce, uh, for uh, the forward projections about how programs are going to be delivered and, uh, and the like. And uh, as I pointed out before, we have put ourselves in a position where we've corrected uh, Labor deprioritising defence, taking money out of the ADF, and not only have we stabilised, but we've increased the spending. And over the forward estimates, we go beyond 2%. Uh, 
and we grow uh, to next year $48 billion a year uh, and, you know, by $3 billion or so each year from there. Uh, and, as I said before, my judgment is that we will need to commit more to defence into the future as well. Uh, I suspect your argument as a, a journalist from the Canberra Times is not that there should be less jobs in Canberra. Uh, and, you know, Zed Sezel just pointed this out, I think, uh, incredibly powerfully about the union between the Labor Party and the Greens. If Anthony Albanese is to win government on the 21st of May, it will only be uh, in concert with uh, minor parties, including the Greens, as happened uh, when Labor was last in power. And the Greens have a definite policy to cut billions of dollars from defence, which would mean tens of thousands of jobs from defence and from defence industry being lost, including in places like Canberra. And Zed and his colleagues here are standing firmly against that. Uh, and thank goodness for it. And we should point out that difference. And I think it's the uncertainty that Labor brings uh, if they're elected on the 21st of May, but not just to the department and to people wearing a uniform, but also to the 100,000 people that now work within defence industry across the country. Thank you, Mr Dutton. Now, uh, next question, Daniel Hurst. Daniel Hurst from Guardian Australia. Minister, to a substantial matter within your portfolio, the implementation of the Brereton inqui inquiry reforms. The Chief of the Defence Force, General Campbell, has said transparency would be key to this process, and your predecessor, Linda Reynolds, said she would regularly update Parliament on how Defence was going with this, and yet you haven't once mentioned it in Parliament. You approved the Afghanistan inquiry reform plan on 26th of May last year, but it wasn't released for more than two months, and it was just quietly posted on the Defence website on a Friday. And FOI documents have shown that CDF warned you that retaining the meritorious unit citation, quote, poses unacceptable risks to the moral authority of the force and threatens the international and domestic reputation of the ADF and its capacity to operate effectively. The action could be perceived by international counterparts as dismissive and a failure to accept accountability, close quote. Minister, why have you hung the CDF out to dry and why have you failed to keep the public informed of these important reforms via Parliament? Daniel from The Guardian, one of my favourite publications, I might say. I'm glad you read it. Not, uh, <laughs> I'm being sarcastic, of course. To the, <laughs> to, to the uh, substance. I'll answer. To the substance. I'll it's answer. an important Come on, matter. Hill. Get yeah, you've asked your question um, and I'll answer it. Uh, I have... Uh, found and I've known Angus uh, for many years. Um, I found him to be an incredibly uh, effective leader, uh, a person with great capability, uh, an affable person, somebody who provides inspiration to many that he's led over a long period of time. Uh, so don't dare say that I have undermined him as the Chief of the Defence Force. I never have and I never would. Uh, so I take that very seriously. And if you have a suggestion uh, that you'd like to substantiate your comment uh, with as to something I've said, uh, then you should table it here today. And, of course, you can't. So FY I'll, I'll answer your question. And so we have a situation where, as Home Affairs Minister, in response to serious allegations, along with the Attorney-General of the day, we set up the Office of the Special Investigator. We did that on advice from the Australian Federal Police Commissioner, on advice from the CDF and from others, and looked at all of that advice and we took a decision to set up uh, the OSI. Now, that is, uh, has at its head uh, uh, an eminent, uh, legally qualified former judge. It has an investigative capacity. It's doing its work. And so we have moved into a different phase. I'm not commenting on investigations. I'm not commenting on uh, whether a particular investigation is up to a certain stage, whether somebody is about to be arrested, whether somebody's just been cleared. These are proper investigations that are undertaken by the OSI. So it's not a play thing. It's not uh, something that should be disregarded. I have the utmost respect for the men and women of the Australian Defence Force, including those within uh, the SAS. Uh, I'm not going to hang people out to dry, but if people have done the wrong thing, then there's a process to answer to. Uh, but we are following proper process here. There's not going to be a situation where uh, we're leaking information about a particular individual in your publication uh, or any trashy publication like it. Uh, we're not going to do that. Okay. We're going to allow the police to investigate right. the matters and if there's sufficient evidence to prosecute, then they will prosecute. Okay. Cool. Mr O'Connor, your yeah, response? <clears throat> well, I think it's fair to say we shouldn't be commenting on individual matters that arise in that way. And we support 
the, uh, the uh, office of the investigator. Um, I do think, though, and it was before Peter's time, I mean, he's only been in the job for about just over 10% of the government's term in defence, and he's number six. Um, but, in fact, when Linda, Linda Reynolds was defence minister, um, I think it was unfortunate that she chose not to appear with the CDF when the uh, Brereton report was publicised. In fact, I remember being on Insiders, uh, just about to be interviewed by David Spears, and, and I couldn't believe it, but there was the CDF taking the guest appearance instead of a minister, instead of uh, Minister Reynolds, which I think just showed that the government was willing to walk away from political leadership on that issue, and they should not have. Now, I'm not saying that's happened with, with Peter, but I, I do say it did happen at the time that the Brereton report was, pu was published publicly, uh, and I do think the, the government should have stood up, stood aside next to the Chief of Defence Force and answered the questions about that matter. Otherwise, to the extent that uh, Peter answered that we can't talk about these matters until there's a proper investigation underway, I, I accept that proposition. Yeah. Thank you, Mr O'Connor. Our uh, next question, uh, Lucy Murray. Lucy Murray from SBS News. My question is to Minister Dutton. You said just before that the Solomon Islands Prime Minister has not said a word of criticism for Mr Morrison. But yes, yesterday, Manasse Sogavari said his government is being treated like kindergarten students with guns in need of supervision. Clearly, he's angry. What will your government do to improve relations? Well, a couple of points. I mean, firstly, uh, I don't believe those criticisms were directed toward Australia because the relationship we have with the Solomon Islands uh, is uh, an incredibly important one and uh, it'll continue to be so. Uh, the Prime Minister has literally, I know there's sort of this you know, trendy sort of pile on of Scott Morrison uh, in different parts of the media and around the country at the moment, but Scott has gone out of his way to form those personal relationships at different fora through bilateral discussions uh, and he genuinely believes uh, in the family of the Pacific. And I've, I've heard him relay conversations uh, that he's had with different Pacific Island leaders uh, in National Security Committee discussions. Uh, so I can understand the pressure that uh, Prime Minister Sogavaro is under at the moment, but in Australia, as he said, he finds a good friend. He finds somebody that uh, is reliable. Uh, he's not suggesting that we can't provide uh, support to the Solomon Islands. We've got ADF and Australian Federal Police on the ground in the Solis now. Uh, and that will continue to be the case. We haven't withdrawn effort. We haven't been asked to withdraw. Uh, we, we, we were requested to go there. And the NSC took a decision that we would do exactly that because we wanted to help a friend. Uh, but China operates by very different rules. And if you want to pretend that this is a problem of Australia, well, pretend it's a problem of Japan in the East China Sea. And pretend that it's a problem of India on the land border where the Indian troops have been killed and pretend that it's a problem of the Philippines that are, you know, at odds with the Chinese government at the moment and pretend that it's a problem of Vietnam where their, their, their waters are being fished out. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a, an issue worldwide. Talk to the Sri Lankans where the port's just been taken back because they can't meet the debt repayments uh, to the Chinese government. Um, we're, living, we're living with that reality and you can you know, sort of dance around the, the different, you know, half sentences and the nuance here and the nuance there. Our country faces a very uncertain time. And now is not a time to risk a change of government to, to a weak government at the next election. Mr O'Connor, a response, please. Well, I think it's fair to say that Scott Morrison should have put in more effort. He should have made a phone call to the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands. Uh, he should explain to the Australian people what red line means. I think that's why you might be getting a response we, we are getting a response from the Solomon Islands after the rhetorical red line reference, which was never explained. I've sought a briefing uh, from the government as to whether something has changed so significantly as to allow the Prime Minister to invoke that phrase, but uh, I don't suppose there is. I think it's just a rhetorical flourish. But it's really that lack of engagement, the fact that the Foreign Minister wasn't in a position to visit. It's been a long time since a senior ministerial visit uh, to the Solomon Islands, and I think we've dropped the ball, frankly. Thank you, Mr O'Connor. We're unfortunately out of time for um, a further questions, so it's now um, a one-minute closing remarks. Uh, Mr O'Connor, can you please go first? Well, thanks very much. Well, this is a very important uh, debate, and it's a very important time for the Australian people to make a decision about who is best equipped to defend this nation. 
who is likely to engage not just hard power investment and defence, and to that extent we agree with the government, but who's going to deploy diplomacy, who's going to invest and within the region and internationally, who's going to make sure that we are um, uh, engaging fully, sincerely with our neighbours. They're not just our neighbours, as I said before, they're our friends. Which government really seriously believes in sovereign capability, investing and enhancing uh, local defence industry to manufacture defence assets here? I would say an answer to that question is a Labor government is more likely to be engaged in diplomacy as well as investing in defence. It's a Labor government that's more likely uh, to be uh, investing in defence local industry, making sure we have enforceable provisions to allow for local content in those very large contracts. I think the government's dropped the ball. They've been derelict, regardless of the rhetoric of Peter. They have let the Australian people down, and it's time for an Albanese Labor government. Thanks Mr. very much. One minute. Well, Andrew, on the 21st of May, when Australians uh, walk into that polling booth, they will be faced with a choice. Our country is grappling with security challenges of scale and complexity that we have not experienced since the Second World War. Australians have a choice about who will lead our country through a dangerous and uncertain time. It's a choice between an experienced Morrison government that has invested in our security, has made tough decisions and has a track record of keeping us safe and our country safe. Or the alternative, a Labor Party with a weak leader and a track record of failing to properly fund our defence force. It's a choice between a Morrison government that has a plan for a stronger Australia and a Labor opposition that has no plan to keep us safe. Under the coalition, defence spending has increased by over 60%. Navy spending is up by 76%. Army up by 49%. And Air Force by 132%. Under Labor, defence spending was cut and it was cut and it was cut further. They delayed or cancelled or cut 160 projects. The truth is that Labor can't manage the economy and they can't manage national security. Right. They did it uh, in the Defence Force just like they did it in our national security and law right. enforcement agencies. Okay. Our country you... at this time cannot afford Labor okay. at the next election. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both for uh, appearing today. As they say, the, uh, the, the first job of a, a politician is to get themselves re-elected, so we appreciate you've taken time out from your local campaigning to, for, to participate in this uh, important debate. And thank you. If we can um, ask you to shake hands and thank, thank you very much. Thanks, <laughs>